Welcome, everybody, back on Siegel Talks here at the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY in Manhattan, New York City at City University. And uh, it is week 12 of our daily talks with uh, theater artists from around the world, a global view on how the uh, corona crisis, the time of corona has affected the life and the work uh, of everybody, but especially artists, theater artists, performance artists. And, um, and we feel this is an in incredible time of uh, upheaval, of change, of uh, interruption, of disruption. And um, as always, what we have always done in the Siegel Center, but now especially as we feel it is important and significant to hear voices from artists. They're on the right side of history, on the right side on the struggle, the complex struggle for freedom and for liberties. And we have to listen to them and their lessons and their experiences uh, um, of significance. Um, as Tanya Pugera yesterday said, Tanya from Cuba, she gives us a wonderful talk from a very complicated time in Cuba where people now spend 12, 15 hours in line for food where the government more or less is declaring their own people as enemies now. Um, she said that, you know, what is in art might help us, it might save us, change our lives, and we have to change ourselves and first in an authentic way, but we also have to change the world how it is. As we see, it's not working. Forms aren't working. Structures aren't working. It's a disaster, especially in America, and it's an open uh, uh, Fukushima uh, uh, catastrophe, as Richard Chakna said, where we look at from the roof and... Uh, and uh, we are horrified, and especially in America now with the killing of George Floyd and so many others, uh, um, tensions that where they already are breaking out are obvious, and we all hope that something will happen that is a real change, lasting change. Um, in our talks to now almost 60, 70 artists or 80 artists from around the world, we have often visited Africa but uh, today we have a very uh, a special um, a guest um, with us. It's Hope Azeda from Rwanda. She's the founding director of the, the Mashirika Creative and Performing Arts a Company, one of the leading companies uh, in Rwanda. And uh, Rwanda, of course, is a country that went through a horrific, horrific civil war in 94. There were once uh, uh, before, of course, uh, in, the, in the 60s, but it was a horrific one. Um, where uh, uh, it was a genocide against the Tutsis, Twa, and the moderate Hutus um, a day after an assassination um, of the president um, in, um, in actually in the time we live now. It was, I think, in, in, in April and uh, 500,000 to a million people were killed with machetes and rifles. Uh, 250,000 to 500,000 women were raped. Um, it spread into Zaire, now Congo, where 200,000 people had a horrific uh, uh, event, speaking of tensions, racial, ethnic tensions, and the country somehow uh, is back or is trying to get back on its feet, and theater has played a role, and Hope uh, created for the 10th anniversary of the genocide and the 20th and 2005 and 2004 uh, uh, theater work, and uh, so we're going to hear from her um, about uh, this unique country. And uh, uh, she also got the, the award, the Marcel Guarnier Award and Gilda Award from the International Week of Women in Theater, Professional Women in Theater. And um, so hope, um, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. Where are you now and what time is it? Uh, I'm in Rwanda, um, in Central Africa. Um, or the heart of Africa, or the, I mean, the land of a thousand hills, or the land of milk and honey, whichever way you want to go. Mm. And right now it's 6 p.m. It's 6 p.m. with uh, four minutes past, and uh, it's a beautiful day, very sunny, and uh, we are going on with life as it is right now. Mm. What, sit, what city are you in? I'm in Kigali. I'm in Kigali right now, yeah. Kigali. Yeah, what's your neighborhood? Tell us a little bit. And how is the time of Corona? What's happening on the streets? Very little, of course. There, the Corona has hit. Uh, it's a global crisis, of course. We are not unique to it, and we have all, we are still under lockdown. But a few things have opened up. 
but the streets are not as busy as they used to be because different organizations and different um, institutions or companies have been told to like, you know, have less people to, of course, going by the COVID rules of social distancing and wearing masks. So everyone on the street is wearing a mask. They are walking with one meter apart and it, it's just crazy to see how humans are choreographing themselves on these streets. And, you know, after Corona, things just don't look the same. Uh, and uh, I don't know what is going to happen after here, but it's, it, uh, today I was in town and I was just looking and watching how activities are slowly coming back to life. And it is not the rampant city I used to see. The speed is slower. People look less motivated when they're walking. Usually you would see people walking very fast going to some place, but it's now they're a little slower. There is a, some sense of um, normality coming in place, but it's not as what I used to see before. Mm. So yeah. tell me about, was there a lockdown? Are you still under lockdown? When did it start? Well, the lockdown started uh, around the month of, I think around end of March coming to April. And uh, we went with like what the whole world was going through. So we all went under lockdown, of course. And uh, it really came at a very crucial moment when me and my theater company, we are working on a performance to commemorate uh, victims of the Rwandan genocide against Tutsi in 1994. So usually the 7th of April is a very uh, big day. It's a national day for us to mourn uh, those victims. And as artists, we have always been part of this recovery journey. We've worked on different performances every year, working with, with the country where we are theme-wise. So our theme for some reason this year was breathe. And uh, we, were mm. working on a, we were working on a performance called breathe. And then suddenly uh, the rules of COVID, you know, came unexpectedly and we felt we, we were told to stop rehearsals and just all of us get go back and, you know, go in the lockdown as everyone, which was very saddening for us. But again, we had to accept and know that it was for, in the faith of, it was in good faith. And uh, we had to look for a way, how do we mourn our lo lost ones in terms of COVID? Uh, because we're used to like gathering in big numbers, uh, holding hands, hugging, crying together, even when we are rehearsing these performances, but this was not going to be the same. But as artists, we tried to work out a, a plan B, which was like, a flame is very important. Lighting a candle is very important in these times. How about we as performers go light a candle in our homes and let that candle be our guiding light, be our guiding light to the home of hope. Uh, if you're a dancer, try and engage and you know, interact with that candle. What does that light mean to you? And then it turned out that in that time, the world was looking for light we're all looking for this light. And I was very hopeful that whatever we are going through as a human race, there was going to be time and we go through this because uh, the humans, we are, we are wired with the, uh, with the mass of resistance. We could really survive this. So our performers went into this and we are sharing videos internally of you know, dancing with a candle in their homes. What does that look like? So it kept them busy, but it kept them, it kept us trying to make us stay sane as artists because there was a lot of now, a lot of anxiety, fear, what next, you know, trying to exist in the unknown space that we found ourselves in. Because I found myself to, it lo we looked like we are walking on this highway and suddenly you drop deep in a dark hole. And then suddenly you're searching for the light to come out of this dark deep hole, out of this journey. And uh, slowly you start like, you know, uh, looking for your way out, looking for a path. And uh, that has been our journey. But when, it, when we got hit by then, for me, it was a time to reflect as an artist. I was like, okay, 
we are going, we are now in lockdown. Events are being canceled all over the world. We have an event in July, which is a, a festival created for the sake of humanity, Women Arts Festival, which happens after a hundred days of genocide that we mourn. So we are like, we cannot just wait for 100 days, 50 days, 20 days for this day. This is the time for us as artists to work more, to reflect more, to, to, to re, recraft our work. So at that point, that's when we started on a journey called 100 Stories of Home. And we, we started a um, uh, weekly series on our social media platforms. And that also kept us on our feet. Actually, we've been very, very, very busy. Tell me, it's last... instead, yeah, 100 Stories of Home? Yes. So tell us a little bit. So you, you reached out, or who organized this? So 100 artists participated and created uh... Uh, actually, it was not strictly tied around the, the number 100. The 100 just became a reminder that it took 100 days for 1 million people, over 1 million people, to be killed, you know, to be systematically targeted and killed. So 100 days for us was just a name to help us, but we were open to more stories. So it was not just strictly 100 artists, it was 100 stories. And any story could have as many people as it could. So the people organizing this is me and my team, and or, which that usually organizes a festival called Ubumuntu Arts Festival, or Ubumunu Arts Festival. Ubumunu be, means being human. And uh, it's a festival that goes by the philosophy of Desmond Tutu. We are human together. Oh, I am because you are. You are because I am. So my team, we are like, we have, we cannot cancel the festival. We cannot die twice. How do we now migrate our festival to a digital platform? So we started working on how to run this weekly series. And we sent out a Google form to any artist using our platforms who was interested in sharing. And we gave them the guidance of, the theme of the festival, which was stop, breathe, live. So we're, we're asking for these kind of stories. And from Monday to Friday, these stories run in different categories. So like Monday, it's curated for young people and youth or youth. And that Monday, we called it Flames of Hope. So it is works from young people or for young people created for just with that theme. So um, on Tuesdays, we do what we call a home chat with Sonia. A home chat with Sonia is where one, one of our presenters pays a visit, is how the festival, you know, pays a visit or knocks on the door of artists and checks on them. How are you doing today? How has it been going? What are you doing? It was like our way of just paying a visit to artists all, all, all across the globe. And we've been running that every Tuesday on Instagram Live from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. So it's a so live when visit. I, it, she has a camera and uh, the audience yeah, sees yeah, yeah. the same moment as Sonia does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Sonia goes live on Instagram and interviews an artist from anywhere that we have picked around the world. And you have two of them engaging on Instagram Live for one hour. And you have people participating and doing a Q&A questions. And uh, we do that. We live tweet that uh, on our Twitter handles. And um, the IGTV video, of course, already saves it. All these series are there since we started. When they, if people can visit, uh, visit our our social media platforms, they will find all this work is saved on IGTV. So it's like series that have been running, but that's for Tuesday. On Wednesday, we run what we call Beyond Now. So Beyond Now is any works that are experimental new works of art that artists are coming up with, or artists that the kind of works and it involves like projection mapping and all that. So it is new works of today or projecting tomorrow, or what artists have been doing in the COVID time. So we call that series uh, Beyond Now. So we go to Thursday and 
that we have another IG live or Instagram live session for an hour, uh, which is dubbed discussions with the diaspora. So dias discussions with the diaspora is whereby, again, one of our hosts uh, checks on the Rwandan people who are living outside Rwanda or have lived Rwanda and have returned, checking on them on with one main question, what is the definition of home? What does home mean to you? Where is home? And you know, it's been amazing just listening to all these stories. And again, these stories are set. And then our last uh, program, new content is uploaded on Friday and we have called it Ripples of Soul. Ripples of Soul is a lot of work going in healing, uh, healing works, healing works or testimonial works or very deep stories that, you know, share our experiences as human beings, but stories that evoke and awaken empathy and reminding people that what my pain may be today could be your pain tomorrow. And uh, it's, that is what we've called ripples of soul. It is that kind of uh, curation that invites back soul into our space of art. Mm -hmm. Is this kind of a documentary st style, like people tell their life uh, on the Friday sessions or? Uh, uh, on Friday sessions, it, we collect different works that fall in this theme. So it, it could be short videos of three minutes, two minutes, one poem that talks about depression. It could be, you know, some works that have been reproduced previously and we use like trailers, but it could, it is that story that helps our viewers uh, I, that facilitates our viewers to go through an introspective journey, just to question what is a human being? Where am I in all this? So there are quite deep stories, which I was at first very uh, not comfortable to share with people online because I was not sure how they are going to be received because of, they are quite heavy stories. And these are the stories that help us go to places uh, tell us, uh, what is the story people tell you? Um, really, I mean, a story, for example, or for example, about crimes against humanity in times of genocides, for example. Crimes against humanity in times of war-torn areas. When, uh, crimes that go in uh, homicides, you know, it's about uh, the wounds that people carry. It's about those kind of real-life stories, and we call them like they're, they're, they're in a form of testimonies, like testimonial theater in that kind of direction. Mm -hmm. But they're quite strong stories that I was afraid because when we use them in the present, in, in, in the physical spaces where I perform, you find that these stories uh, could open wounds. They are stories that are used to help you tap in that space that you've always run away from, from within to just reclaim yourself and believe in yourself and just be, you know, pick up yourself and collect yourself and keep walking, regardless of what you've gone through, however dark it may be. Hmm. So that's incredible. A hundred artists, it's all online. It's using Instagram, live, Twitter. Um, instead of writing stories about what happened, you, you listen to your uh, audience, your viewers, your artists, they tell their stories and you just give them a digital platform. So do you have a little TV studio where you run that from? Who, who says three minutes now, five minutes here? Who, who makes the decision and how is that technically done? We have a, a content uh, manager uh, who works hand in hand with me and we, we curate all the content, just the way we used to do the festival because the festival I'm talking about has been running for five years. Uh, we started it in 2015. And the way that festival is curated is the same way we are, we've been trying to create this series, but uh, only that it was in a different format, that only that we are now uh, curating for people we are not going to see physically, but an imaginary audience out there online. How many but people, we do it. Mm -hmm. How many people, are, do you have more audience now or less audiences than the festival? It, it's building. Uh, the audience for the festival has built since day one. Um, it started in 2015, but the audience we had really focused on was 
physical audience where people travel to Rwanda to be part of this festival, to do, have the experience of this festival. And when we decided the festival was not going to happen because of COVID-19, uh, we said we cannot cancel this festival. We need to keep going. So we said, how do we now migrate? Uh, how do we do a digital migration to with this kind of festival? So we've been trying to try our best to keep it the way it was, but of course the language has to change. You have to remember, you know, people can't stay on screen for a long time. People have, you know, there are things you are paying attention to and people need consistency. So the audience has actually, an online audience, it has been building up. And you, when you go to, to Facebook page, you find that the followers have really increased over 20,000. And you have the website, people are visiting the website, our YouTube link is working and Instagram, you know, it's all, it's just, we have to like, we have like all these apps, you have to like distribute your content and try understand the language, which language works on Instagram, which work, language works on Twitter, or how do I now take this to Facebook? So we've been juggling with which content goes where, or shall we do a neutralized content? So we've been doing, working around that. How do we create one main content that can fit all of the platforms? So you have over 20,000 followers, people who come daily um, to your events. What did you learn? You said we had to learn the language of each of the platform. Tell us a bit, what did you learn and what works and what doesn't work? Well, we have to learn that uh, before we are looking at focusing on Rwanda as the audience, but now has Rwanda has transformed into a global audience. And uh, we learned that uh, people have challenges of data connection. And during COVID, for some reason, internet was not as fast as it used, as it used to be because people are all plugged in into the internet. So we needed to make our content shorter and to the point. So we, need, we learned doing very short, short, um, sh short videos, uh, but which video loading, up, loading it was not enough. We needed to, up, um, to unpack it the following day. So just the, way, the same thing you do with the TV, uh, previously it was like this. So we do yesterday's video, had this, had these characters and this and this and this. But before that video is, is loaded, we also put some content and introduce that video with why we are talking, why that video and why people should. So we've created that consistency of like introduction of the content, then you upload the content, and then you unpack the content, and then you go to the next. You unpack this means the artists and you, you talk about the work. Yeah. Yes, we are one pack artists because most of them have generously like shared their art as gifts to the to the platform, and uh, I think we we had to learn how to be to unpack and talk about these artists as well. Not just uploading, but credit is not enough. But how about these artists? Who are these artists? So how Why long do they do this? Work? How long are the yeah. videos, and how long is the unpacking, and how long is the announcement of? The announcements are just captions of like short artworks with the quotations or with um, with quotations and introducing the, the title. If the title is maybe like the Conference of the Birds, we talk about that title of the performance called the Conference of the Birds. And then uh, we write something about the Conference of the Birds, the title, the company, the and a short by and the short summary of the Conference of the Birds. So that is the information that comes before before the video. So the video, it really depends. They vary between two minutes and five to seven and around 10 minutes. So we don't go beyond 10 minutes because that's quite too long content for someone to follow, uh, considering the fact that uh, there's data, they have to invest in their data in these kind of things. So you need to like make sense in the shortest way possible. And then the- And remember that- mm -hmm. Uh, and then the unpacking is basically another caption with a photograph from the, from the previous content. So we make flyers, we make flyers with our theme and we get a photograph and remind people that the video that was uploaded yesterday was about this and talked about this and this. And it's more like a, a recap or 
a summary of what we just saw. So we don't just like throw up their content and just leave it to be on its own. We have to accompany the content right from the time it comes on board and after it has come on board. Incredible. And how do we have people access to the internet? Is it easy? Do you pay? Is it expensive? How is it in Rwanda? Well, as long as I've lived, internet has always been a challenge in all ways. Even when the, you're told internet is, exp is fast, sometimes it is slow. So I think internet still has its unknown mechanisms that technicians don't know yet. Even when you feel like it's it's really running slow. People tell you where well, it's going fast, you know. So it's also some unknown uh, weapon we have to just get used to. But it's expensive, of course. Internet is expensive. Yeah. And uh, yeah, internet is expensive. It's not easy to access. And that has been one of the biggest challenges of our, of our artists who want to like take photos of themselves performing and sending us videos. Because we have done also some challenges called like one challenge we've really done was called uh, hashtag dance my story in partnership with the German embassy. And some artists really, the quality of video that they would send over was not really good one because they have a bad telephone one because where they were, there was not enough lighting three. I mean, uploading the content, they can't really send like a long video that to just be short. So there are challenges around data and audiovisual spaces for this kind of work. Mm. But incredible. I mean, um, we are, everybody is trying to figure out in the world what to do. You guys are already doing this in Rwanda over three months, I guess, three, three and a half yeah. months, 100 days. Every day you put out a candle. I thought it was just the Siegel Center. We, in America, I think we are the only institution or in the America that has a content every day related to a theater performance, but you also put up everything, every day a new project that yeah. hasn't been seen before. That is, in, that is quite uh, remarkable as a response and even big theaters are struggling in America, even in Europe, what to do. Mm -hmm. So that is, uh, that is uh, uh, impressive and really my respect and congratulations and uh, are coming, I'm sure, also out of the importance art has and reconciliation um, in Rwanda. What role has art played uh, in, in dealing with this, uh, these unspeakable crimes that happened? A million people called, killed in a, in a hundred days. Uh, it's just, uh, uh, it's just uh, hard to even put my mind around uh, uh, it. And, uh, so, so how, how, what role has art played in society for, for, for working with history and past? Well, what uh, the, um, art has played a very big role because when it comes to a safe space, people need a safe space they trust, a space where they can listen to things that speak to them directly to the heart. And art has been a great tool in taking, in having a conversation or starting conversations with, um, with, uh, with inner conversation within a person himself. So we find that like after, after the genocide, a lot of musicians were composing music that was helping people heal, recover, or inspire, or give them some, some sort of energy, inspiration to, let them, to keep going, to encourage them that, you know, this happened and this, but, uh, but you know, there's still a life to go. You have the courage to move. So there was a lot of inspiring music that was helping people. Drumming. It was right? to hear. Yeah, yeah. Not necessarily drumming, but music, but also drumming was also. Women, a, women thing. started drumming, which wasn't, weren't doing that before, right? Uh, yeah, there's some women, of course, drumming. And I mean, it has been all sorts of, for, of form, forms of art. Uh, visual arts, performance, testimonial theater, people did what they can, just like what you're seeing right now. Every artist is trying to make a contribution. So every artist at that point was making a contribution in just helping the government or the country get back on its knees through any form of art. Did the audience come to, to all the artistic offerings of the gender? Were audiences hungry? Were they interested or were they skeptical? Um, how? 
Oh, oh, the audiences, I mean, audiences, they're in different forms. The audiences that when you advertised your work of art or when people gathered in the, memo in the stadium for, for these big commemoration days, there was a lot of music and poetry happening there. But there was also a way, an audience coming to your work of art means they can also be able to tune in on radio. And when they tune in on radio and they listen to music, they are also uh, audience in terms of listening. They're listening to the music that is speaking to them, that is helping them, you know, is touching on a special place within their hearts. So there is also that kind of content that went on radio and, you know, and, and, and that it, it, there was that kind of art that went to the people. And there was that kind of art where people had to come to the arts. So, there were some performances that went out in the villages or out in the communities, you know, to support in things to do with around justice and reconciliation. So they performed in the on the markets uh, on the plazas or how does this? What did they do? The companies when they went to villages? Uh, when they go to the villages, I mean, uh, any space is performance space depending on where there is safety, when, where people can come and they are all comfortable and they can stand and watch a performance. So it re it's anywhere in the refugee camps, in the markets, uh, road shows, just on the streets, on the streets of busy streets in towns. Uh, one thing with art, it has the magic power that when it is you, you place it somewhere, it's like pollen and the, need, uh, and the bees, or it's like the bees and the honey. So when it's like that pollen of our lives, when you place it in a place, people will come to it because the, everyone is, has art in them and there's something that speaks to them. It brings entertainment, it brings, it's some sort of vitamin or medicine to their lives or healing or, um, art is just a, a, a great companion to our human race. And I think that's why people raise trust art, as long as it's, it's that art that is helping uh, the human race focus on values of humanity. Because we've also had art that has destroyed, like during the genocide, a lot of art was used to destroy or to incite violence. So there's the art that incites violence, the art that builds, so depending on what you want to use your art for, people will always go there. And depending on how their mindsets have been uh, wired, yeah. And what works in them? Because we are also now looking in America, where do we work now? What do we do? We don't have the big theaters. We have to, you know, different forms, like forms you say, where you go out to places, villages, people. What stories do you tell? Is it written plays? Is it puppetry, dance? Uh, um, what form of theaters works uh, when, when you go and tell stories about the history of Rwanda? What works? I think what really works is any form of art, but as long as you know your target audience. If you're going to, if your target audience are going to be five-year-olds, you have to create content. Maybe that's the kind of audience that maybe will be interested in puppets, you know, will be interested in, in uh, like young people's kind of works. And maybe what kind of space, where, where are those children? So what we've had to do, uh, we don't have uh, facilities as you may have in America, mm -hmm. like big buildings to perform mm -hmm. in. But we've, we've tried to make the spaces wherever people are be part of our story. So if I come to perform in your village and maybe uh, we look for a space outside in the outdoor space, and then you look at the levels, you know, you play with the levels of the landscape. You're like, okay, this landscape is high. Maybe that's where our performance should be. And maybe the audience would be comfortable here. So you play with the space. And we've had to have spaces also be part of our storytelling. So instead of being inclined of which space is there, theater is there, not, no, we don't care about venues. Because now when you commission me to do work, I ask you what is the audience, what is the age range? What is the space like? And whatever space it may be, we as artists, I think, uh, have the art and tools to adapt ourselves to any space.
But when you let the space define what you have to do, then it becomes a problem. When you say, oh, I don't have enough lighting. Oh, I don't have like a dressing room. I don't have like what, you know? So we need to like get used to like makeshift spaces and where spaces also become our stories because there's a reason why that space is the way it is. Mm -hmm. And that story in that space should not be edited out when you go to perform in that space. Mm -hmm. it, should, it should be present because the people who live in that space mm -hmm. are naturally connected to this, that space. So it's nice to look like you've come like a visitor to share a conversation other than a visitor who says, oh, I can't sit in this chair. Oh, I can't sit in this. Oh, I'm like, you know, you come with, like that visitor ready to adapt yourself and say, okay, you know, whatever they eat, you eat it, whatever they see, but, but you, you come with a vision and mission and say, well, how about this? So, and also you come as with like, your performance should come as a conversation, not an imposed something to this community if you want them to be part of it. So that's what we do. We do a lot of visits before we take performances out in communities. And we also pre-test the works we take. Pre-testing meaning, we want the audience to be part of our script. We want them to be authors. We want the audience or the community where we're taking these works, we want them to have a sense of ownership so that it, this, the work does not look alien to them when you take it. Incredible. So you write a story or you improvise, you take uh, themes. Um, so they commission you and you look at the space. How, how do you? come to maybe give us an example what what do you create an example they tell you there is a um, there is some research that there's a corona outbreak in this village for example and then you say what is corona you start educating yourself about this corona virus so you ask them what are the facts how does it what is the corona and how does it um, how do people get infected with the corona how many do people understand it? Are they resisting the information around it? Are they buying in it? What are the obstacles? Why is it hard for people to understand that taking precautions of wearing a mask, staying home, is, why are they not buying that? So when you come to us with that research, we craft, we come up with a, we come up with a draft of a synopsis. We come up with a synopsis. We say maybe, Given, on, given the information you gave us, the data you collected, the research you have, this is what we think should be the synopsis. But before we can approve it, we want to get a few focal points in that village where we can take this story and read it to them. We want to see whether it connects with them. We want to see if the characters in this play resonate with the characters. If, you know, are the facts right with this? Is it coming home? So we take that synopsis back to the community where the information was got. So the people in that community tell us, well, you know, oh, I know that woman. Oh, no, that doesn't exist. Oh, yes, this. Oh, you know, they start becoming part of editors. They edit and write the script without knowing. Mm -hmm. So they help, us develop, they, develop, they help us develop characters like that. So we go back to our desk. So we, all, we call all this process desk research because we are still on the desk writing what what in the normal theaters would call table work we are still on the table trying to create a story so we come now we write and evolve the other characters and write what looks like a draft of the first script so we go and read the script back to them so you, how they react helps you know the strengths and the weaknesses of the story you're going to take so after that you go back to your desk and say, well, let's change a little bit here, but all this is perfect. So that's when we get on our feet and start rehearsing that play. So when we rehearse that play, and then we go back to the same community and start telling people, oh, there is a company coming to perform. Maybe we target a marketplace, we target, or, but we work with the local leaders. So we take back that story now to them. And when they watch it, you should see their reactions. It's amazing. It's like, oh, I know that guy. Oh, that man lives just right next to me. Oh, that guy. Oh, I know that. I know somebody who doesn't do that. So at some point, we want their intervention. So we stopped. It's more like forum theater. Sometimes we need their intervention. 
and we create stop moments, we pause in the show so that they can intervene. They can also be part of the performance. So that's in- Intervene in mean they, they have questions or play? Are, yeah, we, yeah, sometimes we start with them. We give, we have like caps or promotional materials. So it's a whole 360 uh, communication strategy of mass media. And this whole communication mass strategy means you have the performance, but you have also promotional materials around that. You have the caps, you have the flyers, you have the t-shirts. So you tell them who got the message right? Who did this? If you do this, we have a t-shirt for you. You know, so you, pay, mm -hmm. you it becomes a win-win game. And then who, the person who asks the best, best question, we give you a cap. So they ask questions and then we look for an answer in the audience. Who can answer that person? So it becomes a whole um, communal space of just dealing with the corona in that time. Incredibly a socially engaged art involving audiences. I like what you said. There's a reason why this space is the way this space is and you adapt to that. Could you share a synopsis? Like what is the synopsis of one of the stories you created? Can you tell us? Uh, one of the synopsis maybe it could be, let's say about uh, domestic violence. Let's say for domestic violence. And maybe, and they, maybe there is a law that protects this woman in this house. And because they are not legally married, the man feels like he can throw away this woman anytime, but they have five children together. And the, the woman is the one who goes to the garden every day to dig, to make food, to, 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 make, uh, to bring food on the table. And, the, and she sells some of her crops, but what the man does with the crops is he just takes the money and goes to the bar to drink. And in most cases, get another side girlfriend. So the other woman with five children is looking after the house, the husband, and the husband's girlfriend. So the woman gets to the point and says, enough is enough. And the, and the man threatens that if you go, first of all, the, the money you don't want me to spend comes from the food which you grow in my land. So you go or you stay. But there is a law that protects this woman. So till the conflict escalates and the, um, the, local, the, the local leaders have to intervene and educate the two that there's a law that protects them. Sometimes it's because the woman never knows that there's a law that protects her and the man that there's a law that protects that woman. So he shouldn't use that power of being the owner of the land to treat the woman the way he wants to. He has to give her some level of respect. So something like that is what you find that some people in law communities do not understand the laws that protect them. And you have to go and help them and sensitize them about the law that protects them. Okay, incredible. So it's about laws, um, telling about Corona, how to deal with it, giving facts, how to protect. So you are, um, you know, um, almost like healers and doctors and storytellers and uh, elderly who, who, to, who to look for the next generation. Um, you mentioned before uh, the big ceremony, the reconciliation was in a, in a stadium in a, uh, um, where, can you tell us what you did there? You, did, you, you created both national ceremonies, if I understand right. Yeah. Um, can you tell us yeah. what you did the first and the second? What did you learn? How did it work? Um, it's, it's just incredible um, that a theater artist was asked to create um, um, the national reconciliation. There was well, not a political speech, uh, it was not a rugby game, whatever. They said, no, we want to have a theater artist create something. What did you do? Well, uh, the whole journey was what I would describe an intensive PhD course on creating art for healing, but art that brings people together. So my first experience was uh, 10 years after the Rwandan genocide against Tutsi. This was around 2004. And um, we were given two weeks to create work. And uh, my training background, I'd never done stadium theater. I had already done black box theater things, like targeting 400 people, 300 people, 
if there are many, maybe 700 or at least maximum 3,000 people. So when we were approached by the Genocide Memorial and the Ministry of Culture at that time, we were asked to create a piece of art looking at the journey of memory and hope. And this was 10 years after. And we asked them, how long did we have to create this piece of work? And they said, you have two weeks. Now, here I am from a background where it takes three months to just make one performance, at least to write it, to produce it, to you know, bring it, you know, to shift from text to um, text to stage. So at that time, uh, we were I we were supposed to do that piece in two weeks, and um, when we asked uh, where we are going to do this work, they said the Soccer Stadium, and we're like, how many people were we? Uh, were they expecting? They said thirty thousand. So every answer I got was making me shrink and shrink and shrink. Two weeks, 30,000 people, soccer stadium. And this was going to be a very big challenge. So 10 years after that genocide, that story of genocide we're going to talk about, uh, we were working hand in hand with the Kigali Genocide Memorial and they were collecting a lot. At that time, they're also building the memorial actually. So at that time, they were collecting a lot of content. And I remember the man who was helping us work together, this uh, he was from Scotland, and he had created a lot of content and collected a lot of scripts and testimonies. And uh, we had had an, this encounter of finding a 10-year-old whose mother uh, had survived in a church, pregnant with him for uh, four days. And the mother has to narrate this story every day. And the shocking experience at that time was like, what questions does this 10 year old boy have? So at that moment that sparked the journey of, why don't we look at this story through the eyes of a child? Why don't we look at genocide through the eyes of a 10 year old boy? asking why. So that's how the script started working. And then we called a few artists and we looked through different testimonies that had been collected by the Genocide Memorial. And we, we just picked testimonies of survivors who were either 12 or 13 or 10 years or 15 at the time of genocide. And our whole piece was looking at, at testimonies uh, for, uh, of young people at that time. So what we did was this young boy of 10, year, 10 years old became the narrator. And then this was a new way of now working in a performance that does not have really a beginning, middle and end, or does not have the usual curve of, you know, re building the arc and then going to the resolution part. We are like, okay, so we have different stories of different survivors. Those are going to be the pillars of our story. And we, are, we had been asked to do a hundred minutes long performance depicting the hundred days uh, the genocide took place. So we used this young boy to question why. So he was like the thread of these testimonies, which are like pillars uh, of this script. So the script had a journey of memory and hope. And when it came to memory, we are going towards more darker. We are talking through, we are going through the deep stories and atrocities these young children had to see at the time of genocide. But again, we had to explore how do we shift from this to hope? So hope became the hopes and dreams of these young people. So the whole performance ran like that. And it was a very difficult process, of course. We started with just 10 performers, but the whole cast ended up being 1,000 because the space was big. So from 10,000 as the core group that was working on this story, we built it to 200 artists, 100 musicians, 100 dancers, plus about 10 young narrators. But the process of doing this work was also another very challenging one because there was a lot of emotional breakdown and a little bit of something, a little bit of gesture, a little bit of you know, any fear or anything that we worked out with images really uh, sparked trauma, sparked tears in our space of rehearsals. And in most cases, we had to stop and stop 
because we needed to recover from the heavy emotions we are going through. And mm -hmm. the emotions of the reliving the stories. Exactly. And the music, that for me, that, that is the time that made sense to me that silence was now also becoming a character in our space of creativity. Because there are moments words failed us in this space. There are moments where we had to just go quiet, all of us, and slowly look for transition from that silence to the music, to the dance and poetry that we are hoping to bring in this performance. And I let the process evolve naturally. And to start by just someone humming a song or by someone playing a flute or by just a dancer trying to do some stretch. And that's how the performance organically made it. Because you could not tell people, cry quickly, hurry up. We have no time. You remember, we have only a week left to the performance. You couldn't do that. You just let it, needed to trust the process listen and connect to every moment and let that moment guide you to the next. And that's how it worked. Because if it worked the, like that with the performers, it was going to work like that with the big audience. So time came and this performance, which we call today Africa's Hope, was performed in the stadium. And it was my first time to see mass trauma happening because a little bit of something from this performance sparked trauma in the crowd of 30,000 people. And while the Red Cross was dealing with one victim who is gone, who is encountered the, the past and they're screaming and another person screams and another one screams. And then the Red Cross people are running around the stadium and taking people to hospital, going taking the, it was just a whole, during the performance, it was just a whole, uh, breakdown of emotions, but we were prepared for that. We we're prepared for that because in, the, in our spaces, we, it happened to us as well. The artists cried, they broke down. And one question in the space was, shall we say the truth or shall we not? If we don't say the truth, then who shall say it? Do we have the courage or shall we let somebody else speak the story? And we had to recollect ourselves as artists in that space to say, it's our duty to say the truth, to carry the truth. Because these stories that have been given to us are gifts that have been shared with the world. And we, are the ch we, have, we have to create a channel to take birth these stories to the world as gifts, but with care and clarity, uh, being very careful not to distort what that story or what that testimony was carrying or contained. Yeah. So it was, that was our experience. Just, but for me, it was for me my, it was a beginning of a new journey to do the theater I do today. Even if it was a production we were working on at that time, it became for me a school of art. It's going for me, it turned out to be a school of soul for art because even today, every story that is given to me as hope, I, I try to encourage my fellow artists that this is a gift passed on to us. We need to pay attention and listen to the story and let the story take the big, big moment. And we, we are just uh, microphones. We are just the state, we're just the channel. We're just the gates of, of truth to the cave of this stories of hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. To, 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 to listen to the stories. And you said the art has to be about healing. We have that moment in America now um, where that hor horrific history of slavery um, is more at the open perhaps as ever, the killing of George Floyd. I don't know if you follow all the American news, the civil unrest. Um, tomorrow is a big day commemorating um, the end when finally in some places and also in Texas, when they finally reached the slaves, the news that officially slavery was ended, there was the law, but they didn't know about it, like what you talk about in the village. Um, what advice do you have to get 
over this to reconcile um, to uh, I know what you created was a ritual in that big uh, stadium but what what do you say to American artists or African American artists or white artists how how should one deal with that national trauma that is underlying since generations and centuries what would could be a, something that it helps uh, the time of Corona brought that out very strongly. What's your advice? Well, I'm not a big expert on this one, but what my advice is that if it happened before, it can happen again. And it's my prayer that what happened in Rwanda should not happen anywhere else. It's not a good place to be. And as artists, we have the power to restore peace. We have the power to heal. Because the world needs us right now. As artists, our work has never been easy. This is the time now for us to use art, uh, to call for empathy in a space where empathy has worked out, worked out to remind people that uh, my pain could be a pain tomorrow you know, to remind people that if history has repeated itself before, it can repeat itself again right now. And also to try and be careful as artists, not to, 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 be, to listen to our conscience because we have the truth. We, me as an outsider, somebody watching America, I can tell that hate has been enthroned in people's hearts. They have worshiped hate and hate has become the king. And this hate has made, created a dehumanization kind of norm that has been accepted. And once dehumanization comes into our space and in our language, in, in, and dehumanization starts with very little things. It's when you start calling someone something else. It's when you start labels. And that journey can lead to the worst of the worst stains of humanity. And if we can work together as artists and try to bring people together and try to stitch these broken glasses together, because it's possible, and not just be bystanders, but be players to call back what has worked out, which is love, to call back love, to restore love in our language. And it starts with us because you cannot give what you don't have. You cannot practice hate and you preach love. So you have to practice love, kindness, those values of humanity that has worked out of us. Then that way you give that back. And we have the capacity to plant seeds of love or hate. So I think right now it's our duty as artists to replant, to, re to, to really come out at the front and use art as a weapon of peace, as a weapon to restore values of humanity, as a, as, as a weapon to remind people that we are born human and therefore we are human together. Besides being blue, green, pink, yellow, whatever it is, besides my beliefs, at the end of the day, we need to breathe together because it just heartbreak, it's just heartbreaking to see uh, that we work towards taking breath away from when we are born with this breath. <laughs> People are born breathing. So there is a time that breath would go away, but we shouldn't be the ones to facilitate its termination. It's not our duty. And that's why our theme this year is stop, breathe, and live. We just, right now the world is in a stop mode to just look at those values so that we can be able to breathe and live together. And there's no way out of this. We have to live together. Yeah. Yeah. Um. This time of Corona, did something change? How did you experience it? Did something change for you in that in that time? For you as a person? 
it changed for me. Now uh, it reminded me that what I'm doing now is a calling. It's a calling to bring hope to life, to bring peace and love. It's a, through art because I stopped traveling. My travels were all canceled. I stayed in one place. I came to a standstill. Then I asked myself, how come the theme of the festival is stop, breathe, and live? Which, uh, which theme we came up with last year in April, because we always come up with themes before. I'm like, maybe the art we do is spiritual, but we don't know. Maybe the art we do has a lot to do with purpose. So I was reminded that art is not an opportunity, it's not an option, it's not anything. In my life as hope, art is a calling and this is my calling. And sometimes when people watch my productions, they say, did you, did, did you just name yourself hope? I'm like, no, I was born like this because I was born and raised as a refugee. And a lot of refugee people at that time had names like that, like hope, peace, faith, and stuff like that. Where, where were you born? So, where, did, where did you live as refugee? I was born in Uganda. And my parents fled the 1959 pre-genocide way back. So I, I not only do works around hope, but I also try to encourage other artists. And that's what we do with our festival to just call upon other artists to tailor humanity in their works of art. Yeah. Yeah, no, it is a, a very, very, very important point. Um, the contribution art can make and if it somehow uh, is creating meaning in a country like Rwanda that went through unspeakable horrors, um, um that is uh, it's something we all um, need to listen to have to listen to and um, also the ways you found now with the digital um, age we all live in uh, for the people who are used to cell phones and um, you know to continue that that work how are you supported do you get uh, do you fundraise does the rwanda gives you or kigali the city how do you make a living how do you get support well, even now in Corona time? How does that work? Uh, it's very difficult because, I mean, uh, the crisis has hit everything. It has hit even our, our projects had to stop. We had to freeze. Everything was frozen, of course. And we're just living from a few revenues we are trying to save. But as a company, we're always doing like commissioned works. How to run the festival, we depend on just donations. Like uh, we launch like a support link, people donate, but at the same time we approach like embassies, uh, different communities to support. Uh, because with the festival itself, uh, we go by the values of humanity, or by, we go by the values of the Kigali Genocide Memorial because that's where it started at the amphitheater. So it, it is supposed to be it's supposed to create a platform with art that is accessible by the poor and the rich, by the educated and non-educated. So we try to make every person, every human being, regardless of your background, to have access to art because we believe art had also reached a point where it was not accessible by every person. It was becoming too hard to get. So in terms of support, we just, you know, that's how we, we just like write proposals, share with people and whoever supports, supports. And yeah, it's just like that. Because right now there's no like specific fund that is just supporting us. The city government, there's nothing. Um, an international organization that you want to, so this is not, it's like uh, donations from people who come to see your work or who see your work online. Yeah, or who just go to our link and support. And we have my friends are supportive. Uh, they go to the link and make some contributions and we are able to pay all the technicians helping us run this or making the videos, editing the marketing team. Uh, yeah, it's through that actually. How big is yes, your team? 
we are not very many. We are like about, we are going up to around eight people. Uh, me curating and uh, content manager, uh, but, but with, when we go towards the festival, we bring companies on board to help us with the live streaming. So the, the, it grows towards the event, but before it's you're like two people behind the scenes hmm. on, on computers. That's then incredible. slowly we, we bring a company to support with the digital marketing, websites, you know, like in and out technicians. Hmm. That is just... Um... Just um, incredible that you are the way in the same way dealing with the same problems that companies around the world now. And, um, but you have found answers. Um, all your practice already mm -hmm. is doing what many companies are discovering now to reach everybody as you're the rich and the poor, um, the educated and the uneducated, to go to places, to be inspired by the, by the, uh, by the, by the space, the this, this site. Mm -hmm um about the location and um that you create stories that were brought to you and you put them into a form you have audience feedback so you use all digital platforms um mm -hmm. to, uh, to 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 promote your work there's an incredibly contemporary forms you 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 um you found and that you are outside that you don't expect people to come into the black box but you you go towards them and, and then also the contribution you made was the first and then the second big national healing ceremonies, rituals that also worked. Um, it is uh, just astonishing and you really have um, our highest respect also as a woman to put this together. And it seemed to be so often women who, who do such work as you do and, and often they are overlooked and they don't uh, or get to do the work that they would do so much better. So it's a truly um, a great testimony um, to, to, to Africa. And we are all Africa. We all come from Africa. Um, so this is a really inspiring and significant and important and a great reminder also what works and that art should be also on the healing side, on the spiritual side. So really thank you for, um, for sharing all of this. Would... Um, um, what advice do you give? Let's say they are like theater makers who listen to you in Chicago and Atlanta um, in, uh, um, or in um, other places in Indonesia, Hong Kong, people having uh, Brazil, which is going through very difficult times now. Um, what advice do you have how to use this time of Corona and what advice do you have for them as artists? What should they be focusing on in their art? Uh, connecting, connecting and building networks because that is where one of our, this, that's our biggest capital, networks. How do we merge? Because how do we stretch hands? Now that we are going digital and we're online, I think this is the time. I mean, like you reached out to me and we are, we are already working together. Your, 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 this program is being aired on our Facebook Live. So we need to somehow merge our platforms and support each other. And if you have things out there, let, we can live stream them on our platforms. We just need to support each other with things that we have. Like I can do a performance when I'm physically in Rwanda, but I could do it in Indonesia. So we need to merge our efforts and our energies and support each other but also make our work and our spaces like an open church or like an open our doors to our worlds and get out of our comfort zones because that's one thing i've really loved seeing a lot these days um we were not we were we were in our own caves but with this time, we need to come out. So there's a lot of beautiful content you can find now online. And we're all diff. Uh, I love poetry. So I join like all poetry groups and Facebook groups. Just to be, I join every network that speaks to me just to make sure I can communicate what I'm doing. And yeah, we need to match. And we need to know that this art we are given is also a gift. We need to share these gifts and uh, to share knowledge. Because uh, right now it's like, okay, when I put my play there, how do I make money out of it? We need to like, you know, how do we survive together? If you have 
if Hope is trying to do a festival and she has like a registration line and your people want to know about what Hope does, share the link. Let's share. Our, all we need is just sharing what we're doing. And somehow, somehow, all this will fall in one place. And whenever funding comes out, and maybe we can create a big space together whereby we can now have people to start subscribe or you know register online by paying for our works. But before we pay, as we look for how people to buy our works, we are going to get our drums out on this busy street called online. It's so busy that you have to, and if you're not careful, you can drown, like drown in an ocean. You have to like keep being on your feet and be alive and just be involved. Uh, but at the same time, search for what that artist means in your life. Because for me, at the end of the day, it's, does this piece have any meaning in your life? What does it say to you? Once it has meaning in your life, it will have meaning on other lives. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. This is very, very beautiful to say to you. Let's get out of our caves. And I mean, that is where Plato's uh, famous uh, um, uh, uh, story about that we mankind started, our art started, we're sitting in the cage, there's the fire and we see shadows at the wall. We don't see us ourselves, but we see reflections and we try to interpret it. And, uh, but it is time perhaps also for mankind, we get out of the caves of our minds. You say we do a sharing and um, we listen to each other and, um, and uh, get the drums out, you know, that uh, and drum loud and uh, and participate. So really, uh, hope. Thank you. Uh, that was a really um, significant advice you give, and there's a lot to learn from. We have to take that very serious. Um, what you say. So really, thank you for sharing. What is your website? Uh, what is the name of the website? Well, we have two websites for the web um, for the the festival right now, which is happening in July. Uh, it's happening from the 17th. To the 19th, and uh, it's called www.ubumunu or ubumuntu at festival.com. Uh, and then uh, we have the, also the Mashirika one, which is the company I work for. And right now, we need attention on this festival created for the sake of humanity so people can come register and be part of this beautiful space of global artists sharing their works around Breathe. Uh, in July, and right. we have incre we have incredible performers. So we hope people can be able to join. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So your festival is also designed for a global audience, not just Rwanda. We will put the links um, on our site. Maybe also HowlRound can uh, do it. If not, try to f Google Hope Azeda Rwanda Festival. You will come, uh, I am sure, to the site. And, um, and to see what our colleagues in Africa are doing and what we can learn from them. They are ahead of us, it seems, in many, in many things and um, things we have to learn or re relearn. So thank you for, for joining us. Uh, tomorrow we have um, Saman Amini, a, a, a refugee also from, uh, from Iran, um, a Persian who ended up in the Netherlands as a young boy, somehow ended up in an acting school and creates theater work that people are listening to. And, uh, think it's meaningful. And so we hear from him, how is it for an artist to be there in the Netherlands and also the time um, of Corona. Next week, uh, we have um, more or less the program set. We have Muriel Miguel and Gloria Miguel from the Spider Women Theater. It's a Native American theater company in New York for, for many, many decades. They are working and trying to create work that is meaningful, respect their, their, their uh, indigenous heritage and connect also to modern life. Um, Tuesday, we have Daniele Francisque from the Caribbean, from Martinique, uh, who will tell us about uh, Martinique and uh, her work. The great Eugenio Barba, an Italian theater maker living in Denmark, the Odin's Theater, everybody who studies the history of theater knows about his work. He's a, a legend and a significant uh, uh, theater artist and thinker and philosopher um, of uh, theater. Um, we will have uh, Liva Yati from, from Syria. Um, maybe Nigel Smith will join next week or the week after, um, or Patricia Arisi, or um, we uh, will have um, um, other artists. So um, stay tuned um, for, for the Seagull Talk. So we take you on a journey around the world 
And uh, it is really significant to hear that. Your story was very important uh, to hear also for us and your message, uh, how to deal um, with uh, art conflict and change. And um, again, congratulations. Thanks to HowlRound for hosting us, uh, Vijay and Sia and, and Travis and Siegel Team Sen Yang and Andy. And uh, it's important to uh, have our artists speak, but it's important for you listeners to, to be there, to, to listen to their stories, give importance to what they have to say and find a way perhaps how uh, that what they say creates meaning also for you or might change your life. This is uh, what uh, um, we heard uh, yesterday from Tanya Bugera, very important talk also from Cuba, from her experience was perhaps also moving from conceptual visual arts to theater. She will do a Brecht piece and she claimed why. And she said, we all have to engage in art because it might change ourselves and our lives and therefore the world. So thank you very, very much. And to our audience, really, thank you for listening and being with us. Uh, stay safe and stay tuned and hope uh, all the best. And really, uh, congratulations on your work. All my respect and, um, and stay safe and keep in contact. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much for having bye -bye. me. Bye-bye.